That Triathlon Show, episode 62. What's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode my guest is Jacques Devore from Sirens and Titans Fitness and the author of Maximum Overload for Cycling which is a book that outlines and describes a strength-based program for cyclists to improve maximum sustainable power. And that is what we're going to talk about in today's interview. It will be just getting down to the nitty-gritty of the program. How exactly do you do the sessions? What are the different phases of the program? And how can it benefit you as a triathlete? And uh, just a little teaser, Jacques has been wor- working with, for example, professional cyclist David Sabrisky. And when David used the program, he increased his power by 15%. And that was uh, at the tail end of his career. And so that is uh, a massive, massive benefit that he has gained even at the high end of the spectrum of athlete abilities. So let's just go into the interview with Jacques Devore. On today's interview of That Triathlon Show, I'm with Jacques Devore, who is the author of Maximum Overload for Cycling. Welcome to That Triathlon Show, Jacques. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So in addition to being the author, you're also the CEO and owner of Sirens and Titans Fitness in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, And uh, what else do we need to know about uh, your background and your bio, and especially as it pertains to this uh, book of yours, Maximum Overload for Cycling? Sure. Uh, First of all, I did have a co-author. I want to give him credit, Roy Wallach, who helped tremendously with the authoring of the book. So, uh, uh, but I was the uh, physiologist behind it all and developed the whole program from a uh, training standpoint. Uh, I'm a strength coach uh, with the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Uh, I've been a strength coach for close to 20 years, and uh, I've coached all types of athletes. Uh, I was an athlete myself in high school and college. I was a wrestler. I ran cross country. I played lacrosse, uh, all kinds of sports, a lot of martial arts uh, from kind of emanate from wrestling. And then I got into cycling later in life uh, and uh, am a cycling coach. I'm also a uh, primal health coach, uh, which is, you know, given me a lot of uh, information on you know, eating and regeneration and these kinds of things for my athletes. So we train all kinds of athletes, but I have a specialty in strength and power training for endurance athletes. And maximum overload as your strength training program is is called is uh, designed to improve, as it pertains to cyclists at least, improve your cycling fitness in, in less time. It's a time-effective strength-based program. So can you give us uh, a 10,000-foot overview of the program? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, if you look at what wins most endurance sports, cycling specifically, is it's not the person, if you're a road racer or a mountain bike racer or something like that, it's not the person that has the best sprint. They may win one race, but if you want to win a grand tour or you want to win a road race, it's the ability to hold power for the highest percentage of your maximum power longest. Hence the term maximum overload and maximum sustained power and absolute power. Uh, Most of the uh, programs that are out there for cyclists and endurance athletes overall are really kind of somebody taking a strength program for a soccer player, a football player, and trying to adapt it to an endurance athlete. And in the book, I talked about the gap. Uh, The endurance athlete, most uh, endurance coaches didn't do a lot of weightlifting and most weightlifting coaches haven't done a lot of endurance uh, training. I've been fortunate to do both. Uh, I started as a wrestler and spent a lot of time in the gym and then became a cyclist later in life and said, if sustaining maximum power is what wins a bike race, why don't we spend more time figuring out how to improve that? And that was the kind of epiphany for me Uh, in terms of how can I create a program that allows a cyclist to uh, keep him holding power for longer periods in time. 
So that's the 10,000 foot overview. It's it's not a weight, uh, you know, a lot of people go, well, it, you know, it's a weightlifting book for cyclists. No, that's not what it really is. Weightlifting, if you look at the physics behind power, it's force times distance divided by time or force times velocity. Strength is your ability to generate a force. So strength is a component of power. I'm not trying to take a cyclist and turn him into a weightlifter. I'm trying to get the strength, the force part of the equation high enough that if there's a big gap there. And then I go to power, absolute power. You know, how high can you jump? Uh, these types of measurements. On a bicycle, if you had a power meter, it would be what's your 100 meter sprint power? Is it 1,000 watts? What, what may it be? And then once we get those two boxes checked, then we say, okay, how do we sustain the highest percentage of that maximum power the longest? And that's the real thrust of the book. That's a great, uh, great, um, great introduction and a great description of the program. So uh, I, I think that you could talk about three different levels and that would be the exercise level and the workout level and then the actual program level. So uh, I don't know what do you think is the best order? Should we start with the program level or the exercise level and uh, dive a little, a little bit deeper into this? I think the program level is the better place to start. And I maybe, and I don't know if I'm interpreting it right, but basically, how does the program flow overall? Uh, because then, then people, uh, and in the book, uh, it starts with a self-assessment, and uh, you have to ask yourself, what are my limitations? What are my strengths and weaknesses? Do I have hip mobility issues? Do I have shoulder mobility issues? And this is a, an important part of the program that. You can clear up a lot of problems very quickly, but a lot of people don't like to spend time on this because it's not the glamour part of it. You know, everyone says, I want to get to the walking lunges. I want to get to the big heavy deadlifts. I want to get to that because that's going to get my legs stronger. Well, if you have a, a T-spine mobility problem, if you have hip mobility issues, if you have dorsiflexion issues, then you're going to get to the heavy lifts and you're going to get to hurting yourself in those heavy lifts. And that's why... The program flows from self-assessment first, uh, and I have a number of different tests that you're going to go through to see how you squat, see how you move, and then I would give some uh, exercises that help to clear some of those up. And then the next portion of it is increasing force production. So those would be included like single leg, uh, leg presses. I like the hex bar deadlift. You have access to it. You can do straight bar deadlifts. You can do squats. So you can do, there's a lot of choices and a lot of exercises we put in there that are good for cyclists. The problem with a lot of cyclists is, uh, and this is what a lot of people that write weightlifting books don't realize, most of them have very poor upper body strength. So if you're going to try to do something uh, for their lower body, which is really strong, you need to take into account the idea that they don't have upper body strength. So that's why I like deadlifts better because then if a cyclist gets in a problem, he can just drop the weight. You know, he doesn't have to worry about putting a heavy weight on his back where he may not have the strength to be able to handle that. Uh, using dumbbells and these kinds of things lowers the risk for injury. So the first step is self-assessment. The second step is developing force production. So you're going to try to get that strength up as high as you can. During this period in time, you're also trying to establish your absolute power. I call it APO in the book, absolute power output. And we use the walking lunge as a test. In other words, what's the most amount of weight that you can put with dumbbells in that 12-step walking lunge? And so maybe you start with 10-pound dumbbells. Maybe you start with no dumbbells. And then you slowly find a number where your speed is good, you're explosive out of the lunge, and you can't get any more weight on it, but you have the most that you can handle. So that establishes your baseline level of power in that exercise. And then the next step in the program is, okay, now I integrate this into mini sets. Now, the reason for these mini sets are interesting, and this is where the science, you know, uh, where I came up with this idea in the first place. I had read a bunch of research from a couple of Stanford exercise physiologists where they had studied power lifters in their weightlifting sessions. These are big weightlifting guys. And they found that if they cooled their hands with a vacuum and ice cold water, they would actually be able to get bigger overloads in a workout. 
and they got a lot stronger. So they created this piece of equipment called Cool Control now that does that. It has a vacuum. You put your hand inside of it and it actually cools the muscle during the workout. So I started asking myself, I said, what happens if you don't heat the muscle up that much? Could you do more efforts? Hence the mini sets. So what we do in our walking lunge sets is we're doing a maximum output of power with a small amount of rest so that the muscle is allowed to stay cooler and not heat up and over fatigue. And this allows you then to hold more time at that maximum power. And to kind of tie a bow around this whole thing, what it allows the body to do is make an adaptation by spending so much time at maximum on that power curve, the body has to adapt by recruiting more muscle in order to accomplish that goal that you keep asking it to do. So as you extend the time in those mini sets, you're asking your body to go longer. You're not adding weight to the bar. So you see that you're still at maximum, So you're, st but you're asking to perform at maximum over and over again by having a gap between uh, the time that you get fatigued, you know, slightly fatigued, and then the next set. And that allows you to have multiple reps at maximum. Uh, so then when you're on the bike, you're able to hold power, not any higher than you would, but the first climb, instead of putting out your max output, maybe you're at 40% less than what you were doing before. The second climb, you come, you come up, so you're able to hold power longer. So that's the program in a nutshell. Perfect. And uh, a couple of follow-up questions. First, the force development uh, phase of this program, how long is that before you start with those mini sets? Yeah, I like to, a lot of it depends on the assessment. So, you know, you have to say if I have, a, I had Denise Mueller, I highlighted in the book, uh, she set the land speed record for a woman and now she's going to go after it again. I just was on the phone with her the other day. So in a year from now, she's going to get after it again, try to break the overall record. But she set the record at 147 miles an hour. She had been a weightlifter, you know, even though she wasn't cycling and she came back to cycling in her 40s again, she was always in the gym. So she had a pretty good baseline of strength. So that person is going to progress with force production a lot faster than someone who may never step foot in a gym. And you have to, you know, there's a thing called proprioception, which is the choreography of muscles to uh, execute a particular movement. That's why when you first do a lift, you go, this feels kind of weird. And then the second time you go, it doesn't feel so weird. It's kind of like learning to ride a bicycle. And I guess that would be a good analogy since we're talking about cyclists. How long did it take you to learn to ride a bike where you could just jump on the bike and feel pretty comfortable on it? It takes a, a, little, a little bit of time. Weightlifting is a little simpler, uh, but the analogy has some merit. Yeah, so, so it's, it's individual. Got it. And then the second follow-up. It is individual. But typically, just to give you a little more meat on there, it's probably going to be, you know, three to six weeks where you're going to get close to this season's max lift that you're going to get. So let's just look, use the deadlift as an example. Let's say you start with 100 pounds, you're able to lift on a hex bar when you first come to me. You're going to probably get to 150 to 175 pounds in somewhere between you know, six weeks or so, because you're going to get a big neuromuscular response. You're going to get uh, an understanding of the movement pattern. You're going to get more stabilization muscles involved. All of those things will start firing better and you'll be able to move more weight. So you're going to make a big jump fast uh, and then it'll plateau until the next season. So that maybe answers your question a little bit better. Yeah, it, it does. And I appreciate it. Uh, I'm big on, on getting examples and practical takeaways and getting meat on it as you say then the second follow-up questions on on that would be for the mini sets themselves if not for the listeners that at least for for my sake because i was uh, trying to stay with you but it's still not quite clear to me what would an example mini set look like let's say when you're transitioning from the force development phase and you first start with those mini sets and those walking lunges if yeah. you can break it down into reps and times and so on 
Definitely, definitely. Okay, so I'm going to just take one little step back and give you an example uh, so it's clear as to what we're trying to accomplish in the mini set. Uh, in this, in the strength industry, they call it time under tension. Uh, that's what they call it. How much time can you spend at a particular load? And what we're trying to do is not the strength side of the equation, but time. Spend as much time as we possibly can at your absolute power output. That's what we're trying to accomplish in the mini sets. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how this works. And I'm going to use a bicep curl as kind of a rudimentary example of it. Let's say you were doing a bicep curl with 25 pounds and the most you could do is 10 reps in a row. So the total amount of weight that you lifted was 10 times 25 pounds or 250 total pounds. Are you with me? Yep, definitely. Okay, good. All right, so that's the most. On that 10th rep, you're running out of gas, you're barely getting it up, but you got 10 out of it. What would happen if I did three reps in a row, rested for five seconds, did three reps in a row, rested for five seconds, three reps in a row, and rested for five seconds? You're going to get 12 to 15 reps total in that set. So now what happens, I've increased the total output from 250 pounds to somewhere closer to three, 400 pounds total amount lifted. So you see, by having those little rests, it allowed you to get a much bigger overload. That's the principle behind it. Does that make sense? Definitely. It's very, very familiar from interval training as well. Yeah, so it works for, and that's why in the book I said this works for intervals. So what we're going to do now is we're going to shift from the bicep example to the walking lunge, which is not a strength exercise, but a power exercise. So now let's talk about the power. So your first Thing that you need to do is you have to set the baseline. Now, when we were using the bicep example, the baseline was 25 pounds for 10 reps. You could do it. We're going to try to do the same exact thing with the walking lunges. So you do a couple of sets and you finally say, gosh, I can keep my speed up in 12 reps uh, in a 12 rep set and I can do 20 pounds in each hand. So I've got 40 pounds and I'm still, I'm dropping into the lunge, I'm exploding out, dropping into the lunge, I get 12 reps, all right? So think about that bicep example. Now what we're trying to do is expand the amount of time. So the first set I do, I walk down the hall, I do 12 reps, you know, I, I, I feel pretty good, I'm really explosive, I rest for 10 seconds, 15 seconds in that range, and then I go back the other direction with another 12 reps. I say, wow, my speed's still good. I'm still explosive. That's taken us about 30 seconds of time. I turn around again, and I go back again. And I go, I'm still feeling good. My legs are getting a little fatigued. I feel it, but I'm hanging in there. Okay, so now we're at 45 seconds. And then, boom, I go again. By the fourth set, I'm going, gosh, I'm getting kind of fatigued here. You've done 48 reps of explosive power. If you had done all of them in a row, you wouldn't have gotten, you probably would have gotten 15, 20 reps total. But you got 48 reps of overload. It took you a minute. That's in the book. I say try a minute because most uh, cyclists have some cardio. This is why this program works so well for endurance athletes because you have to have a cardio engine that's big enough to support the long duration runs here because your heart rate goes through the roof. So now all of a sudden you did the first, your first workout on maximum sustained power and it lasted for one minute straight. You did four mini sets with about a, you know, eight, 10, 12, 15 second rest. Now people will ask me, Jacques, how long should I rest? I go, one of two things has to happen. All of the rest and the number of reps and the amount of time is dictated by the speed of your reps. If you see that you're grunting and groaning and barely coming out of the hole, stop, because you're no longer producing maximum power. You're doing a sub-maximum effort. We don't want sub-maximum efforts. We want maximum efforts on these. And then the break gives you the ability to hit maximum again. And so as you get better at it, you would go from that minute I have a, a, a cyclist who's uh, in the book, David Barr. I've been training for about a year. He's a Category 2 bike racer. 
his power has gone up, I don't know, maybe 15. Uh, he just he texted me today and said, you know, he's now at five watts per kilogram for 10 minutes. Uh, so he's getting in that zone of that pro level of cyclists that, you know, where you need to be able to do about 20 minutes at five to six watts per kilogram. And, uh, and, he, and he's really made this bump in it since he's done this. Now, he will do uh, six minutes straight. So he does a six-minute effort where the amount of reps, if you're doing, you know, and he's doing it a little differently because we do it on a Versa pulley. We're doing four to six reps every 10 seconds, and we're doing two legs at a time on a piece of equipment called the Versa pulley, which I highlight in the book. So he does that over six minutes. He's doing close to 100 total reps uh, in one effort. It's crazy. At max power. And I measured the power. Yeah. Yeah, uh, great. That's a fantastic, uh, fantastic example, and and showing show, showing us really how how a workout looks like. So, is, but is that it? Is that what comes into workout like this? So, when you do your first minute set workout and you get to that one minute, for example, are you done, or is there something else to do? Yeah, you would be, here's what you would do. Then you would stop and you would go full recovery after that. So that's usually four to six minutes. And I tell people, you know, do some core work. Uh, rest completely if you have the time, but if you're, if time is of the essence, and that's the idea behind this book, is to be able to get this done in about a 40 to 45 minute workout, uh, so you can spend less time if you have a job and a life and a family and all the things that go with not being a professional cyclist, uh, then you can do it, uh, you can throw in other exercises that I call finishers that you can add, and there, a lot of them are in the book, so you could do that. Uh, and you could do, you could say, okay, now I'm going to do my second minute and you're still, you're fresh enough and you get another good minute out of it and you go, I feel pretty good. Take another rest, full recovery, and you hit a third minute. Now, if you can do three minutes in a row like that, then you're probably going to be able to start adding. What I usually do is I add 15 to 30 seconds at a time. So basically one more run. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So yep. you go, okay, I did four runs back and forth. I can do another 12 rep set and I can still be clean with it. My form is good. I'm not all over like a noodle. You know, I've got good integrity in the, in the lunge. I'm explosive in the lunge. And then you add another 15 seconds or 30 seconds and you say, I think I can do another one. And then what I like to do is depending on the event itself will dictate whether I'm going, if you're a track racer and you're more of a sprinter, then you may go heavier for shorter. If you're more of a long distance climber and you're out there for four hours in a bike race, then I try to have less sets, longer duration. Mm. Got it. And one quick follow-up question. Can you give just a couple of examples of those finishers workout if somebody wants to go and try this? Yeah, I have a lot of them that are, that are kind of the do-it-yourself uh, interval, uh, you know, core work where you could do uh, an ab wheel. I, I show in there. I use an ab dolly. It's a little more sophisticated, but it's close. You can put a towel on the floor with your knees and slide out. Uh, you can do body saws or planks. You could do dumbbell rows in between. Anything that doesn't tax your legs. You can do, uh, you know, rotational stability exercises, which are really important. Uh, bird dogs are a great one because you're helping to strengthen the lower back, which is really great for cycling. And a lot of people neglect that, you know, you could do shoulder, you could do mobility exercises for your upper body. So let's say you have thoracic spine issues and you're saying, okay, well, this is a great way to recover between my, you know, maximum sustained power sets is for me to do a mobility exercise. So you could do, you know, band pulses for your shoulders. A lot of cyclists get way hunched over because you're always in that, you know, position where you're sitting on a seat with your hands on the bars, you know, you can do a lot of upper thoracic spine mobility exercises. So those would be a list of the things that I would throw in. They're not going to tax your legs, you know, and they're more mobility driven or core driven. You just don't want to tire yourself out. That's the real, uh, that's the caveat. And I would find those weaknesses that you may have that you want to shore up. 
Would you think that for triathletes that are listening to this show that doing some swim specific strength in those like doing stretch cord works or even last pull downs or something would be good to do in between those because they wouldn't fatigue the legs? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, because I'll throw in the lat pull downs, dumbbell rows. Uh, usually, what I do is I do do two exercises in between those sets. One is a upper body pulling exercise, and then I throw a core exercise in. Okay, perfect. And do you, by the way, do you have any triathletes as examples in the book, or triathletes that you worked with in your in your practice? Uh, no, I haven't worked with. I have worked with triathletes in the practice, uh, but I haven't any that are in the book. Okay, but but do you have you seen the benefits on them as well in their cycling? Yeah, in fact, one of the triathletes said that he saw the biggest benefit. He's a good cyclist as well. He saw it really in his running, you know, is where he saw a lot of it was in his running. The minute, you know, any type of incline, anything else like this, because triathletes have a tendency to shuffle. They're quad dominant uh, because, you know, they're biking. They don't use a lot of the legs in the swim, more upper body, and then they're running and the runs are so long and they're just steady state runs. They're not like you're getting a lot of hip extension like a sprinter would get unless you go uphill and then you have to really start using more hips. If the road starts to rise up at all, then you can't shuffle as much. You have to drive through. And so that's where he found it. He uh, in his runs, it helped a lot. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I got to say, I'm uh, as a triathlete myself uh, competing at a relatively good level i i'm very very interested in in trying this out over the the, the autumn and winter as a building for next season because i, I think that well, this sounds also, great if, and, if swimming is your weakness you can apply the same principles with a power exercise on an upper body pulling exercise so you can apply the same principle to, to an upper body pulling and improve your pulling power tremendously Tremendously. You would do the mini sets the exact same way with doing some band work or whatever you use for your swim uh, 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 power work. So uh, you could do that and it works. I, I, I have swimming specific athletes that I've improved dramatically with using the exact same protocol. You just change the exercises. That's fantastic. I mean, this is uh, getting better and better all the time. I'm really, really excited about this and uh, definitely need to get a hold of your book and, and diving into it in more detail. Uh, one of the final questions that I have uh, before getting into the rapid fire questions is uh, you have a chapter in the book on performance enhanced eating. So just briefly, what uh, what do you have in that chapter and what are the main takeaways from it? Yeah, the main takeaways are you want to lower inflammation. Training and exercise is a controlled form of inflammation, and then your body responds by healing, and so it can adapt to the uh, overload and the inflammation so the next time you don't get as much. So you want to create an environment that's anti-inflammatory because you want to the, – the, your real enemy is time, and so you need to speed up recovery, and that means eating, sleeping, all of those. So the easiest takeaway is eat real food. You want to eat real food. Uh, you want to uh, uh, have as much color in your diet as you can. So what I tell people, organic protein sources wherever possible, tons of color, uh, reduce the starches uh, and the grains as much as you possibly can because grains are inflammatory to most of the population, even in small amounts, uh, and get plenty of sleep. So uh, I follow, you know, Mark Sisson wrote a, uh, on the back a caption on the book, and if you want great ideas on how to eat real food, you know, he's got a wealth of it at Mark's Daily Apple, and he's a big paleo guy. So uh, it's really eating real food. Get rid of labels. That's the eating, the no label diet is what I like to call it. On a personal note, I'm always curious to hear because I, for triathletes and endurance athletes, I think that uh, carbohydrates are pretty important. But as you say, grains may cause uh, inflammation for a lot of people. So what would you say are good carbohydrate sources for triathletes that would keep that inflammation low? All kinds of any, any vegetable that's carbohydrate, br Brussels sprouts, yams, potatoes, you know, fruit in moderation uh, with great timing. I think that what you're finding with most endurance athletes, and I consider triathlon uh, a substantial endurance athlete, 
uh, you know, because your long duration endurance training, if you can start utilizing fat as a greater fuel source as opposed to carbohydrates, you'll get better performance. And you're seeing this in the ultra endurance community. So you want to create an environment where you're lower on the carbs and all the science points to training in a low glycogen state, racing in a higher glycogen state, because then your body gets very fat adapted. So you just want to create that environment. And I talk about that in the book. Okay. So let's move into the final part of this interview, the rapid fire questions, starting with what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to triathlon or strength training, your field of expertise in general? Uh, Strengthcoach.com is a great source for the weightlifting side of the equation. There's for there's a great resource for someone like you or someone who really says, I want to dig down into the science called strengthandconditioning.com. Uh, uh, for $10 a month, they give you all of the research and do a meta-analysis on everything from hypertrophy to nutrition to weightlifting for it. So, but it's more exercise physiology driven. My, my favorite book for exercise physiology, if you want it for... Uh, more, I would hear, I do have an answer for your question. Pierce Astrand, A-S-T-R-A-N-D, is an exercise physiologist from Sweden, I think, so more on your uh, part of the world. Uh, and he has excellent research. He studied the Kenyan runners. He studied all of these people in endurance sports and, and really learned a lot. A lot of the stuff that we're doing now with Maffetone and some of these other people that are looking at lower heart rate training uh, coupled with high intensity intervals uh, is really, you know, uh, becoming more and more popular and less of this no man's land training. We talk a little bit about that in the book. Uh, and so his book uh, on work physiology is amazing. And then if you want one that is great for weightlifting and exercise physiology, Mel Siff's Super Training is a classic. He worked with a lot of the uh, Eastern Bloc, you know, Soviet uh, Vershansky and some of these other, you know, guys who developed a lot of what we're doing today in weightlifting. Perfect. And uh, the next question is, uh, what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? And let's keep this one very short and brief. Yeah, if it was weightlifting, it would be a hex bar, uh, the trap bar that I show in there for, for lower body lifts. Uh, if I was to talk about cycling specific equipment, uh, I would think that if you can afford it, having a power meter is uh, 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 an excellent piece of equipment for someone who really is serious about their training. And finally, who's somebody in weightlifting or cycling or endurance sport that you look up to? Uh, Mark Sisson, definitely. Uh, he was a uh, fourth in the Ironman uh, in the 80s. Uh, he's a wealth of information on, uh, on training both uh, from a nutrition standpoint is where his real uh, strength lies, but he's able to tie it together uh, with training so uh i think that uh, uh i would say i think he's one of the best the other one is dave scott uh who if you remember from the 80s is one of their premier you know one more iron mans than him and tinley were going at it for years in the 80s at the the heyday of triathletes and triathlons i think and uh, i met him at davis when he did his very first iron man which was the very first iron man and i talk about that in the book he was one of the first guys to really incorporate weightlifting. Perfect. And if the listeners want to learn more about you, you can be found on sirensandtitansfitness.com and also on social media. We'll have those uh, linked up in the show notes at Sirens and Titans for Instagram, for example. Anything else that you want to mention before we close off the show? No, I I'm very uh, I'm a big believer in sharing the knowledge. I will email you back if you email me with a question. Uh, so don't be uh, afraid of sending me questions, uh, comments, other things that makes me a better coach. So please go ahead and, uh, you know, don't be hesitant to say, hey, listen, I don't understand this. What do I need to do? And it rolls off my tongue rather quickly. So uh, I will get to it. 
Yeah, and I think that you have definitely been been sharing your knowledge and anybody could go and now start doing this kind of program based on the interview in uh, this interview and the information that we've had. I'm, of course, still going to get the book because I'm very much looking forward to digging even even deeper, as deep as, as possible. But uh, thank you, Shark, for coming on the show and uh, talking about maximum overload for cyclists. It was a great pleasure having you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Great podcast. Thank you so much. I really hope that you enjoyed that episode and found it as useful and exciting as I did. On the next episode of that triathlon show, it will be a follow-up episode to the swim run training episode that I did. And I will talk about together with a few others, including Simon Briarley, my coach and race partner for the Finnish Swim Run National Championships that we just recently did, about how the race went, all the experience and uh, knowledge that we got from it and what we did well and what we would do differently next time. So that will be kind of a different episode and we will have different audio clips and a story-based podcast if you want. So be sure to tune into that. And one more thing that I want to mention is that you can go to scientifictriathlon.com forward slash free plan to download the free Olympic distance training plan for intermediate to advanced triathletes that I have created and that I'm currently uh, gathering feedback on. So it's uh, free for now and you can find that on scientifictriathlon.com forward slash free plan. Nothing more to add for today's episode. As always, thank you so very much for listening. I really do appreciate it. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.